November 30th, 1989. And uh, my husband was already sleeping. And I got into bed. And uh, because I am uh, a Christian, I say uh, a prayer to myself mentally. And, uh, and so that's what I did. I prepared as usual to go to sleep. I said my prayers in my mind. And I felt a strange presence in the room. Two girlfriends and myself were out running around around two o'clock in the morning, out in the country, spying on one of our, one of her boyfriends. And uh, this was in November of 77. Um, I remembered uh, seeing a light dancing around the sky and kind of laughingly joking with my friend saying, oh, look, the UFO. And one, the girlfriend driving thought it was funny and we giggled and the other girl got really scared in the back seat and so we were laughing at that too kind of obnoxious 17 year old you know uh, well then the lights started getting closer and we all started kind of getting the creeps because it was acting stranger and we were feeling really weird and uh, the girl in the back seat just went bananas and she like dove into the floorboard screaming and hollering and um, I remember the car slowing down I remember she slowed the car down and we rolled her windows down to look out and get a good look at this thing and then it was fuzzy for me for a while after that, what I remembered, except for driving home, you know, and suddenly realizing it's 4.30, 4 in the morning. She looks down, her girl driving looks down at her watch and goes, oh my God, it's 4 o'clock in the morning, you know, time flies when you're having fun. Kind of snotty like, but um, then I remembered more later um, about that night. We were driving, looking at the light, and uh, then this, thing, this huge black thing, black craft like swoops down in front of the car. And I see all this, it, it's like the car is en enveloped in black, you know, and I can't see out or anything. Um, it feels as if I'm being pulled out of the car by my legs. And uh, then I uh, eventually remembered uh, being on an odd kind of table where the bottom dropped out and the legs went up, and feeling um, this something hard and cold going up inside of me. And I woke up in the middle of the night, immediate aware because there seemed to be something very wrong, and uh, I opened my eyes, and I was in a little round room, and there were these strange figures around me, one with a big. Uh, head and big black eyes and others with that were small and blue moving very quickly and uh, I kept trying to keep waking up because I couldn't believe they could be real and how had I gotten there it seemed it seemed like a nightmare from which I couldn't awaken is what it seemed like and I struggled with it for a few seconds and then when I still could not wake up and I began to feel that I was awake I started to scream because I was really frightened and at that point they turned on a, a machine that had a sort of soothing sounding voice but very electronic and it kept saying what can we do to help you stop screaming first of all an abduction can happen to one person or two or three I've got cases involving seven people at once but uh, let's say first a nighttime visitation which is very typical uh, let's say a man and woman are asleep and uh, the man wakes up. He doesn't know why he's wakened up and realizes that he's paralyzed and absolutely cannot move. And he's quite terrified, doesn't know what's happening, cannot alert his wife who seems totally oblivious, sound asleep. We use the term switched off. Uh, at some point, he becomes aware of a figure in the room, or several figures. Either they approach the bed, or they're standing by the window, or whatnot. He next finds himself levitating off the bed. He will find himself then floating, usually towards the window. Uh, let's say it's a closed window, and he and the small figures float through the closed window. This is not an out-of-body experience. If he looks back to the bed, if he can see back to the bed, he's not in the bed. He's, he's gone. Uh, he floats out the window, and there's usually at, outside some kind of intense light, which 
functions as some sort of tractor beam or whatever you want to call it, and the person and the figures are floated up into the craft. He floats up into the craft, usually through an opening in the bottom, and finds himself very often immediately on a table without his clothes. Very few people remember the act of either disrobing or being disrobed. He's on a table and a series of uh, medical procedures, quasi-medical procedures, then are undertaken. Uh, they end up uh, very often focusing on the genitals. If it's a male, uh, very often uh, some kind of instrument is placed around the penis. Very often at that point, either painfully or through some kind of induced climax, uh, a sperm sample is taken. Very often uh, probes are inserted in the nostril or, or ear. Uh, there are a series of other procedures that happen very frequently. Sometimes nerve centers are stimulated and various muscle groups will move. Uh, we don't know why any of this happens. Uh, the person can be shown some things, very often can be shown a small child or a baby. Uh, even men are shown these strange hybrid offsprings and then <clears throat> eventually the person is returned uh, the same way he came back to bed, often dropped from a certain height onto the bed, uh, still not disturbing the wife, and uh, immediately goes to sleep. In the morning, wakes up, has no idea what happened, is this a dream? Very often we'll find his pajamas on the floor next to the bed, doesn't remember having taken them off. Very often he will notice uh, pain or odd sensation in a certain part of his body and finds a small mark. Now that's a typical kind of nighttime visitation. We have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these cases. In 1991, Bud Hopkins and I uh, decided to find out how many people have had abduction experiences in the United States at least. In order to do that, we went to a national polling organization, the Roper Institute, the Roper Poll, and uh, we asked 6,000 Americans whether they had experiences that abductees say that they have had before they knew they were abductees, like uh, traveling on the astral plane or seeing unusual lights in their room or, or uh, having missing time episodes and things like that. Uh, we asked 10 questions. Uh, ultimately, we found that 2% of the American people, at least, at the very least, have had experiences that abductees have had before they knew where they were abductees. Of course, each one has to be examined individually to see whether they've had abductions or not. But it's an awful lot of people. People, and it suggests that the phenomenon is extremely widespread everywhere. I've been interested in uh, the boundaries of human consciousness for quite a few years, and uh, yet when I first uh, heard about this phenomenon through a colleague of mine uh, who told me about Bud Hopkins and his work, I thought this was some kind of madness. And uh, so it was a gradual process of talking with him, of seeing these cases, and realizing that I had no explanation as a psychiatrist of what people who are now called abductees or anomalous experiencers were, were undergoing. It, it behaved like real experience. And so the question then became, what is going on? Because psychological uh, or unconscious or uh, inner uh, experiences or past experiences which uh, determine present experiences are very private. They, they differ among people uh, enormously. If you're having a, a, a symptomatic expression which is about something that happened to you as a child or if you uh, have um, or if you're having dreams, or if you're uh, having some kind of uh, fantasy. This will be very personal, very um, variable among individuals. It, it, you will not have a consistent, complex narrative which uh, is similar from one person to another from beginning to end. The only thing that behaves like that is real experience. Something which is generated internally does not have that quality. Certain patterns began to emerge, and. Up until the time I started doing this work, I don't think people were paying attention to any particular sets of patterns as they emerged in the investigations that were underway. Uh, I got very interested in that issue. What were the similarities from case to case? Because that helped establish that we were dealing with some kind of rather um, definite, precise external phenomenon rather than just the, the, the complete range of human fantasy. If you've got patterns that are very tight, uh, 
the idea of fantasy is probably um, very much weakened at that point. Abductees uh, describe approximately four different types of aliens, although we have to be careful because oftentimes we get many different descriptions. But one of the, one, one of the great problems in hypnosis is, is identifying and describing aliens because uh, particularly in a first session of hypnosis, uh, people tend to confabulate and they tend to say things that are not exactly true. So uh, when everything is controlled for, we get about four different types of aliens. One is the standard sort of gray alien that everybody I think is familiar with now. Small with uh, thin arms, thin legs, thin body, big black eyes, uh, no hair, no nose, no mouth, no ears. Then there's ones that look more insect-like, maybe like a praying mantis, ones that look more reptilian-like, and ones that look more human-like. In the end, it doesn't matter. They're all seen together. They're all doing the same thing. They're all working together. They're all pursuing the common goal. And therefore, for our purposes, they probably come from one place. And what we are looking at is a unified body of aliens uh, all doing the same thing. The 80s brought the breakthrough for the alien abduction phenomenon. Two bestsellers, Intruders by Bud Hopkins and Communion by Whitley Strieber, presented new witnesses and documented the new aspects of a threatening reality. We didn't, we didn't see the mark in the yard for like two or three days after the night of June 30th, 1983, when I had the experience of being uh, in the garage, hunting for what I thought was a burglar coming out of the garage, because all of a sudden my skin started feeling like I was on fire and like I was burning and had to get out of there, and being hit in the chest by a bolt of lightning, for lack of anything better to describe it like. And um, then, uh, seeing the silhouettes of uh, small figures about four feet or so tall moving in the yard, six of them, um, and moving towards a small or sort of egg-shaped like craft. And, um, and the next morning when I got up, after this was all over with, I, uh, my eyes were swollen shut. I went taken to the emergency room of the hospital who sent me directly to an op ophthalmologist, I guess, an eye specialist who uh, basically accused me of looking into the arc of a welder's torch and somehow frying my eyes. Give me a lot of medication drops and, and cream to put in it. Took a couple weeks for it to heal up. Um, then we saw the mark in the yard and the very first thing that I remember when I looked at that mark in the yard, the very, very first thing I remember is suddenly seeing these two black eyes so, sort of superimposed over the mark in the yard and it stunned me. And my mother was talking about, oh, that's where our UFO landed, and laughing about it, you know. And um, then I started thinking about the Bud Hopkins book, Missing Time. Uh, but in that circular area, all the grass was killed and the ground uh, was, uh, the soil was fused into a kind of rock-like hardness. Uh, the, there was, a, again, a, a something like a 40-foot long, a little bit longer than that, straight swath away from there, away from that landing area, where again the soil was cooked and the grass was killed. Um, now, this is of course something that was very mysterious because the soil was very moist, there had been a lot of rain, but this soil was so dry it cracked open and, as I said, fused on, to an almost rock-like hardness. We've tried to duplicate that effect in the laboratory, taking control soil, and we can't do it. We don't know what kind of energy affected that soil. But at any rate, uh, we know from her recollections where the UFO sat, and that's where the ground was fused, so you have a very powerful kind of physical evidence supporting her, her account. On top of which, the UFO, when it took off, evidently created a tremendous flash, which was seen by a neighbor in exactly the spot where she remembered it having been sitting. And as it flew over the neighbor's house, uh, all of the lights went out in the neighbor's house. She heard a roaring sound. She was absolutely terrified. The lights all came back on again without uh, tripping any um, circuit breakers. 
that mark in the yard has, it, it's just healed up in the last few years. It remained there for five years, very visible. Snow melted off of it. Water ran over it. You can still feel it, even though you can no longer see where it is. When you walk on the yard, you can still feel where it is because the ground is still very much firmer than the rest of the yard. Subsequent to the contact experience, I began to have groups of people up to my cabin. I had uh, groups of friends, I mean, and, and they began to have contact en masse at the cabin uh, to quite an amazing degree. Even people who weren't involved at all and knew nothing, little or nothing about it would, would have these encounters. And that continued for about two or three years. Well, uh, I was Whitley Strieber's upstate New York cabin guest one night, and um, when I went to bed, I felt this overwhelming sense of euphoria, as if I had been drugged, and I, to my knowledge, I wasn't. It was a wonderful feeling. I felt at one with the universe, and then I went off to sleep. And a person that was in the room with me also had similar feelings, and also had seen light forms in the room. At first, uh, it was extremely terrifying. When I ran out of options in February of that, of 1986, I was ex incredibly frightened because I couldn't think of any way to explain this. And uh, it was like, um, it was a bit like discovering you're not who you think you are. You know, it was just a, a shocking, terrible experience. And I began to try to work on the fear because it was debilitating, it was devastating, by going and walking in the night in the woods where it had happened. And it became quite obsessive. I couldn't really settle down at night unless I went out and walked through those woods. And at the same time, it was very hard to do because it was extremely scary to do that. And the visitors began to react to this, to my effort to overcome my fear. And they began to come back to the house and showed up. They began showing up fairly frequently. And uh, I didn't have any more abductions, but I had a few contact, very brief, sort of half put together contact experiences that didn't quite work uh, because I was too scared to take it any, to take it farther. I tried to wake my husband, eyes still closed, and there was no response from my husband. And that's when I did open my eyes and I looked straight ahead. And there was this thing, this creature, standing at the foot of my bed. And it was the first time I had ever seen that, consciously. I was awake. I hadn't gone to sleep yet. I was saying my prayers. Uh, and um, so by this time, my legs were numb. And uh, I sat up in bed, dragging my heavy legs with me. And, turned up behind me and threw a pillow, big pillow, uh, that I made. You would think that I stuffed them with rocks because it was heavy. And I hit him too, that creature. And uh, my next conscious memory, uh, fragmented memory, was um, seeing white fabric flow up and over my eyes and then down again. And then I felt something, perhaps little fists or maybe an instrument pounding on my back and uh, and that was all I remembered and then my next conscious memory was that of falling into my bed I could have fallen anywhere from two inches up or two feet up or whatever but I was conscious and I felt myself fall into bed well I was contacted by uh, two of the witnesses by letter and uh, the uh, found out about the third witness a little later on, and then ultimately the fourth witness. Uh, I received a letter from her and had dealt with her on a personal basis. The, uh, there's a fifth witness who I dealt with earlier who had seen the UFO from another point of view. She had not seen the figures 
floating in the air, but she had seen the UFO at exactly that hour on that night. So um, there are obviously many other witnesses. And essentially from some distance, it's about a quarter of a mile, she saw this very large ship above the building. And this occurred after the motor died in her car, and the car stopped, and the lights went out in the car and on the bridge, and on the bridge roadway. And several other cars also stopped with their lights out. No one knew what was happening to the cars, why everybody's automobiles were stopping. And she looked to, the, uh, to her right and saw this enormous object very, very brightly lit above a building. And then a uh, blue-white light came out from the bottom of it, and she, at that point, saw these figures. She didn't know what they were at that time. They looked like balls. They were people rolled up in a kind of fetal position, came popping out of the window 12 stories off the ground. And they all unfolded at once and uh, then were taken up quickly into the craft, this whole thing taking roughly about 12 seconds. And then the craft moved away. And her descriptions exactly corroborate the descriptions of uh, the two intelligence security agents uh, in the car down below uh, who were accompanying an important political figure. They all saw the same thing with the women's saw, except they were closer. I think you have to remember that this is a phenomenon that is not only just stories that people tell. There's a very strong physical component that is related to this, that, that everybody is involved with. For example, when people say they're abducted, they're physically missing from their normal environment. They're, they're not there. Nobody's ever found anybody who has been abducted. People come back with unusual marks and scars on their bodies that, uh, that weren't there literally the day before that are all abduction related. And it's important to understand that people see other people being abducted. Of the 750 abduction regressions that I have done, that I have investigated, uh, fully 20% of them are of two or more people. Therefore, people can confirm each other's abductions. They see each other, and sometimes the person is not, one person's not abducted and the other one is, and they still see it. Furthermore, the precise detail that people describe is extraordinary. They can describe certain instruments that are used on them, and we know what those instruments are for, and they may not understand what they're for. They may not even know it, but we've seen those instruments so many times, we know what they're for. Not only that, but when they describe procedures, they'll describe procedure A, procedure B, procedure C, and we know procedure D is coming and they don't know it, and then they go ahead and describe procedure D, just like everybody else has done. So therefore, any theory that accounts for this phenomenon must take into account its strong physical component and deal with it. Oh yes, I'm certain that they're happening in the physical reality because I wake up with various marks on my body that I've received overnight. Um, here are some examples. Uh, there's a little piece of skin scooped out of my chin over here. And there's another one that I've had here since childhood, but I never knew how it happened. But this one over here I received this year, uh, I think it was in March of this year, I just woke up with a little piece of skin missing out of my face. You know, when, when you cut yourself or, or scrape yourself, you know, first it's going to bleed and then it's going to scab and then it's going to heal and the scab's going to fall off and have the natural process, the natural healing process. But this little scoop out of skin, never it never bled. There was no scab. It was just not there one day, and the next day I had a healed scoop mark out of my face. Uh, I've had one on each leg. I woke up one day and discovered a, a tiny little, tiny little scar up here at the hairline that had not been there before. I woke up with, with um, various types of other marks on my body. For instance, Back in uh, January and February of this year, I discovered on my back two circular marks that looked like uh, punctures in the form of a, a circle, uh, like seven punctures in a circle and one in the middle. But the ultimate evidence for the physical reality of alien abductions were strange implants left in the witness's body. The issue of implants is an extremely interesting issue because uh, a number of objects, alleged implants, have been recovered. 
and um, the, they vary in size and shape, and they seem to have come from odd places, from, in one case, the underside of the penis, in another case, uh, the nasal cavity, and so on. Uh, these particular objects have in common the fact that none of them are radio-opaque, meaning they do not show up on an x-ray, which is interesting. They're also mainly consisting of organic materials uh, like uh, silicon, carbon, oxygen, and so forth. They're not, um, they don't look like a piece of machinery. Uh, we don't know really what these things are. It's very difficult to get the scientists who have studied these things to go out on a limb and say there's no way that this object could have been produced on Earth. No scientist wants to uh, be forced to try to prove a negative. But yet, none of these things should have been found in the places they were found in the human body. We have no idea of their function either. We have some speculative guesses. But, uh, and we have some x-ray pictures and some MRI photographs uh, of, of uh, mysterious objects in place. Abduction researcher Daryl Sings investigated several of those alleged alien implants. First of all, when we found it, it was it, we were quite excited when the lady brought it to us. She brought it to us quite by accident. She's rubbing her eye the next morning after December the 10th, the next morning, something was bothering her eye. She rubbed her eye and it, and it fell out on her desk and it landed. It's a little tiny thing, but it's so hard, she actually heard it hit the desk. Her boss happened to be standing there and looked at it and says, what is that? She said, I don't know, it's a piece of sand or something. It was in my eyes, hurting my eye all night. And she said, take it to that uh, investigator, Mr. Sims. And she said, it's just probably a piece of sand. She said, don't, take it to him. Please do that. That's the only reason we have that actual evidence. In regressive hypnosis, she describes this object, how it was installed with the surgical instruments and a different instrument that was used to take it out. Uh, first of all, I brought in entomologists, biologists. They looked at it to determine whether or not is it a seed. Is it a plant seed? That's what it kind of looks like when you look at it. Uh, it's, it's a small. And I brought in uh, entomologists to see if it was an insect egg. Of course, I knew, I'd already looked at the object, I knew that was not the case, but I wanted that verified by, by people who, these are uh, postdoctorate students. Now, the individuals looked at this, then I had a microbiologist look at it, and uh, he was quite uh, vocal in his description. He said, my God, what is this thing? He said, it looks like hard plastic on the outside, it looks like an egg on the outside with the end of it open, with packing material on the inside. He said, like something was housed inside this. Where in the world this come from? Of course, all the information I gave him was simply, uh, it fell out of a lady's eye. He said it couldn't. This thing, how could this be in someone's eye? What is, how, what is this thing? I said, I, I really can't tell you any more about it. That's all. Later, I took it uh, then to the, um, to have uh, work done on this with an electron microscope. What we found is uh, rare uh, traces of beryllium and uh, titanium, which tends to, sh t tends to show up in UFO type related material. As, as well as other things, but those were the things that were kind of interesting to that showed up in this object. I started in this uh, by uh, meeting uh, a researcher in Texas by the name of Daryl Sims, who had been investigating the alien abduction phenomena for some 27 years. Uh, he got me interested by showing me a set of x-rays of a foot which uh, contained two metallic objects, and uh, I offered to remove them. Uh, by the time that case was set for removal, another case had come up and uh, were recorded as well as the beginning of a long set of metallurgical findings. Uh, to date, we've done uh, six different procedures, the results of which we have uh, three uh, that are similar as far as objects, and uh, the other three are similar. We have the, let's say, the metallic and the non-metallic. The metallic objects uh, vary in shapes and are covered with a dark gray, dense membrane that you can't cut through with a surgical blade. Uh, the other three were uh, small, uh, BB-sized uh, balls that were grayish, white in color. And 
uh, they are not calcium. They've had one analyzed, and it's a multitude of different elements. Uh, the biological findings uh, include uh, the tissue surrounding area, which shows no evidence of an inflammatory response, which is virtually uh, humanly impossible, and a large amount of nerve proprioceptors, all from areas of tissue uh, where they don't belong. And after these two people were taken back to Houston, I took the implants with me. Dr. Lear did the pathology, so there was a good chain of evidence on, on the objects. He, he sent off the pathology, and from two separate pathologists, he found the following report. No signs of inflammatory response, either chronic or acute, and the wrong nerve cells present, nerve proprioceptors. Nerve proprioceptors are simply the nerve cells that you have on the, their sense cells that you use on the outside of your skin for touch, for taste, uh, a touch and uh, feelings, that pressure, and this sort of thing. These are found in mass surrounding the alleged uh, object, uh, alleged implant inside the lady's feet and also in the man's hand. The two uh, biological coverings surrounding these metal objects seem to be made possibly uh, from the abductee's own surface skin. I think that there's a possibility that uh, the scoop marks may suggest that the alien presence uh, it, it is reasonable for me to believe that they could take the scoop from anyone and culture that and would literally have tissue for you anytime they wanted to wrap an implant with it and install it in your body, which would account for nerve tissue like nerve proprioceptors on the surface of the skin being wrapped around the object, but then how those nerve proprioceptors could reattach to other nerves inside the body, I have no idea. Because as soon as those objects were touched, now you gotta realize this one lady is under uh, hypnotic anesthesia and two local uh, injections of carbocaine. You could have cut her leg off and, and she wouldn't have known it. As soon as those objects were touched, and it was the same case with the man, as soon as the object was touched, not taken out, touched, there was immediate violent reaction, which suggests that the objects were attached to a main nerve. The metallurgical analysis, after nearly $50,000 of research done on them to this date, so far shows us that the objects uh, appear to be meteoric in origin. The reason they, were, they use the word appear is because the closest metals that they have found to these objects is the Winman Staten structure meteorite and the Yautschung meteorite. Now these rare meteorites uh, it could explain some of it, but the problem is in meteorites you have uh, a nickel content of 6% or more iron in a meteorite. These do not contain that. So this has provided some kind of an anomaly for them. The so-called alien abductions or close encounters of the fourth kind made headlines and bestsellers in the USA. But it is not an exclusively American phenomenon. Indeed, we found events following the same or similar patterns all over the world. Philip Spencer, a former police officer, left his house in Ilkley at approximately 10 past 7 in the morning on the 1st of December 1987. His intentions were to walk across the moor and visit a relative who lived in the village of East Morton on the far side. He took with him a camera and this compass. The compass in case he got lost because he wasn't that familiar with the moor and the camera to take some photographs of Ilkley Town from the moor tops. He actually began his walk just below the White Wells building down there and wound his way up the hill to this point where we are. He consciously remembers walking along this path and then up over the rise and past a small quarry. Just as he was walking past the quarry, a movement caught his attention from his right eye and he spun round and he was amazed to see, just about 10 feet away from him, a small green creature about 4 foot 6 inches tall. It suddenly turned and scuttled away at a terrific rate away from him. Spencer shouted out, hey, brought the camera up and took one shot. The creature then continued running around a bluff out of sight. Spencer then ran after it, and as he turned the corner, the creature had disappeared. 
but he was confronted by a silver disc-shaped object which almost immediately shot up and disappeared in the, into the clouds out of sight. Instead of continuing his journey, he decided to retrace his steps and go back down into Ilkley. And a further surprise awaited him there because he discovered that the uh, streets were full of shoppers. The shops were all open and he couldn't understand this because to him it should have been about just after 8 o'clock in the morning. And yet when he looked at the clock on the church tower, he discovered it was now 10 a.m. We showed his photo to experts. Well, it's a very interesting picture. My impression is that it made my, uh, my blood pump. You know, when you see a picture like that, of course, I'm exposed to pictures like this all the time, uh, UFO craft and occasionally photographs of beings, but something about it seems right about it when I first looked at it. Of course, there was the skepticism that always goes along with it because as a scientist, I'm to rule out photographs that would have some aspect of a hoax. It doesn't seem like it's a hoax. It seems that it, it is what the witness reported. We heard about it from the, the chap himself phoning me, inviting us to go up there to show us a photograph he'd taken of this creature. Um, we went to see him. He, well, the first time we went, we were a bit late. We got there in the dark. He took us up on the moor in pitch blackness just to see us the spot. And then we went up again. Uh, we took Peter Huff with us this time. We did an interview, half-hour interview on tape. And uh, then we suggested that, you know, he had this missing time period. We suggested that uh, we could do a hypnotic regression for him if we could find something to do it and if he agreed to it. At first he was a bit worried about hypnotism, but uh, we reassured him and after another week he agreed that he would like to be regressed under hypnosis. So we brought him here to my house, together with the Dr Singleton. They met on a Wednesday and they had a preliminary discussion. They agreed to do the session at the weekend on the Saturday, uh, which then took place, which explained all the missing time period that the witness had about meeting these green creatures and being taken in the craft and shown various moving pictures and um, it also explained uh, his compass being reversed it had been in a strong magnetic field which was apparently connected with the craft um, as far as the case itself is concerned I'm a hundred percent sure that it's genuine hypnosis was carried out by a clinical psychologist and we discovered that, in fact, the story did not begin with the taking of the photograph. It began at this point here, just a few yards from where we're standing. It was at this point where he noticed the small creature coming down the hill towards him. He stopped because he was absolutely petrified with fear and wanted to turn and run but he discovered that every muscle in his body was paralysed, he couldn't move at all. The creature then turned round and started going back up the hill and he discovered to his horror that he was actually following it but he wasn't walking. He was now levitated a few inches above the ground, um, similar to a balloon being tethered by a piece of string. He was pulled up the hill, over the prow of the hill and into the small quarry at the other side. In the quarry, he saw for the first time the silver disc and a door opened in it, but he has no memory of actually going inside the object, just an overwhelming blackness which then disappeared and he found himself in a white room. He was very brightly illuminated with white light, but he could see no source for that light. He heard a voice in his head telling him not to be afraid and ordering him to lie down on a table which was in the room. This he did and he found he couldn't move and he was surrounded by four or five of the green creatures. They carried out some kind of medical examination which basically involved um, a fluorescent uh, light in the shape of a tube which passed along the length of his body much in the way of a body scanner. 
He was then told he could get off the table and given a conducted tour of the object. This involved taking him down a corridor and he looked through a window and couldn't believe his eyes because there was the planet Earth in the distance. And for the first time he realised he wasn't on the Earth, he was somewhere high up in space. He was taken into a room which seemed to be a, an engine room. There was um, a piece of equipment in the middle of it which was like a gyroscope. This was spinning rapidly and his camera, which was hanging around his neck by a cord, was drawn towards it as was the compass. He was then taken from that room uh, into another where he was shown two films. Now these weren't ordinary films, they were more three-dimensional, very realistic. In the first film he was shown the planet Earth and he saw people starving but uh, made much much worse it was our own future and there was a warning here that we had to get our act together as a species otherwise this is what would happen it was then shown a second film now I believe this was very personal because neither under hypnosis nor consciously since where he discuss the details of this it's quite possible from one or two hints I've had from Philip Spencer um, that it predicted his own personal future. The next thing he remembers is being back on the moor and suddenly seeing the green creature and having no memory of what had just happened, bringing up the camera, taking the photograph, chasing it, seeing the object which then rapidly disappeared up into the air. Well, it was a perfectly normal session to him. and He didn't know anything about aliens or spacecraft or anything like that. He was just doing a straightforward regression on a person. And as far as he was concerned, all the normal reactions occurred that a person would do when telling the truth under hypnosis. So he was very impressed with it. OK, well, one of the interesting aspects of this picture is this tubular-shaped object that's up on the horizon here. Um, we thought it was some kind of pipe or perhaps an antenna or something, in doing contour enhancement and building a contour map, like a topographical map, it is indeed a cylinder. And you could view it as a cylinder perhaps three and a half inches or so in diameter, two to three inches, because we don't know the diff distance away. We do know that it's a cylinder shape and it's reflecting light. Therefore, from filtering, inverse Fong shading filtering, we believe that it's a metallic object. We'll have to do some more tests on it to be certain of that, but we know for certain that it's not a natural object. It's not a tree branch, it's not the trunk of a bush or something like that. It's a metallic object. Well, it's um, got loads and loads of ancient stone circles and uh, carved rocks with swastikas on them and that kind of thing, and cup and ring marks. So there's many legends attached to it. But one of the most interesting ones, as far as this case goes, is that Whitewell's Museum, which is a spa, uh, in the 19th century, something happened there. The curator of the museum was going to open up one morning when he heard a noise from inside, and he opened the door, and he found inside several green creatures dancing around the spa. Small green creatures very similar to this ilkley Moor creature. Philip Spencer is not the only British policeman who had a close encounter. So he was driving back to the police station about quarter to five one morning and he was about to turn right at the leg of a T-junction when he noticed something odd illuminated further up the road. Uh, at first he thought it was a works bus, and he looked again and realised it wasn't, so he drove on to have a look at it. He jammed on his brakes within about 30 yards of the, of the object, which he described as a classic flying saucer, blocking his uh, route through the road. He tried to summon assistance with his car radio and his personal radio, neither would work. Then he did a drawing of the object. When, uh, just as he'd finished the drawing, he found himself driving in first gear on the other side of where the object had been, but, and he looked in his mirror and it had gone. Um, he then realised that he'd lost about 20 minutes to half an hour of time. Uh, the object itself was sighted by other police officers on the moors outside Halifax who were looking for stolen motorbikes. 
they uh, radioed in. I have a video filmed interview with two out of three of those police officers. They radioed in to uh, their headquarters to see if anybody could identify it for them. And uh, it, they, 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 the HQ checked with uh, Leeds Bradford Airport, the military, etc. Uh, there were no aircraft in the vicinity, uh, no, nothing, no, no arm, army manoeuvres, nothing that could explain. He then describes a bright light coming from underneath it. He gets back in his car, finds his car won't go. Then he seems to black out. He has a sensation of fl uh, blackness, a sensation of floating. He wakes up inside a room surrounded by several small robots and a humanoid character. He's led to a bed. He's eventually persuaded to lie down on this bed and some sort of pseudo-medical examination or process is carried out on him, which to us does not make any sense. Uh, he receives a telepathic communication from the humanoid character telling him not to be afraid. Under hypnosis, he even describes or impersonates a voice that he hears in his mind, which is a voice I've heard many other witnesses similarly describe. Eventually, when they finish doing whatever they are doing with him, he's put back down again in his car, and the conscious memory, of course, takes over. He's driving on the other side of where the object had been. In London, England, we interviewed Nick Pope, the former official Ministry of Defence UFO expert. In this function, he had investigated several cases of alleged alien abduction. The second book, The Uninvited, deals with abductions, and it was a subject that I was led to logically through my official research uh, into UFOs uh, carried out at the Ministry of Defence. Simply, when I uh, first began to uh, obviously display a real interest in this subject and take these reports seriously, I found that some people began to uh, approach me with stories of abductions. Clearly, I couldn't ignore these very serious claims, so I made it my business uh, to look into the back background to these sorts of claims and to actually do my own research and investigation. My view is that clearly there is something going on here. The official Ministry of Defence view uh, is, is actually rather amusing. They, they were asked specifically about alien abductions and uh, a, a formal reply came back in the form of a letter from the department and it said, abduction is a criminal offence and as such is a matter for the civil police. The most impressive experience I had is uh, a full contact uh, that happened to me in November 11, 1981, at 10.30 p.m. in the south of France. As we were driving to my brother's discotheque on that evening, we saw some lights, which happened to be a spaceship. Of course, at this point, I did not know it was a spaceship, but it happened once in a million put it this way, the flying saucer came up right above the car, and my brother at that time used to drive a brand new Mercedes, which is a very reliable car. Everything died. And we both were totally surprised at what was happening. As we both look up through the windscreen, the only thing we could see is all this light that was blinding us. So my brother was very scared, but I managed to go out of the car. And then for some reason, these intelligent spirits must be intelligent because they turned their lights off. And I could discern very clearly, Michael, less than 30 feet above my head, a flying saucer. This is my first experience, yes, I do recall this one, but remember I was a child and I was complaining as I could not be left alone. I was complaining to my mom that small little thing was coming every night in my bedroom and I described them as little monkeys. Of course, not having any UFOs experience before, I did, I did not know what those things were. And they were very, very close to me. I used to hide away from them behind a the blanket. Then once I get a little bit more courageous, and I kind of peep out, and I had one of them very, very close to me, and I passed out. And then when I was in the regression, I was recalling you know, all sorts of very, very interesting things which I have problem myself to understand or believe. 
but apparently they've done something up here. Well, it was in 85 when I had actually invited them to come because I had met an American Czechoslovakian doctor who said he was flying with UFOs. So I said, why don't you take me along? And uh, one day when I was reading a book called, actually it was a book of poems called um, The First Contact with a Friend, all of a sudden I looked outside from the window and there it was, 100 yards from me, the UFO. And I went into total panic because I realized that I was dealing with something which I didn't understand. That very night later I found out I was abducted for the first time. And that changed my whole life. And all of a sudden I saw myself on a table being operated on. And I'm a medical doctor, so of course I was very interested in the technique. And the technique was very, very advanced in our comparison to our medical technique. To lay, it was laser beams, it was colors, and I couldn't understand what was being done. But I did understand something that uh, they, for instance, were implanting implants into my body, and I didn't know why. Now I know, when I have heard more about it, that these implants are for changing our vibrational level and for helping us in case of crisis for storing information. And that is one of the very big things, I think, that people should learn to know about, that we are being controlled, we are being taught, we are being actually taken as members of the galaxies, as I would say the UN of the galaxies, and the people who have had the contacts and have had abductions, they are the contact people. It's a very positive thing, even if many people are very, very frightened of the medical examinations. I made numerous regressions with people who, under hypnosis, remembered how they found themselves lying on a table surrounded by small grey humanoid extraterrestrials. In other cases, they remembered how they were guided into the spaceship, how the aliens showed them their craft, its monitors, its propulsion. one from the other and they look similar to others that are seen in other parts of the world. Let me explain. Let's say the, the greys, the ebies, uh, that are so much, say, the fashion in the States. You only think of the greys in the United States. Uh, we have some of those but sometimes with other characteristics and we have all other kinds, I should say that we have quite a quantity of cases in which they look like humans or like very similar to humans or much more beautiful and taller than humans or like what we would call not monsters but freaks of nature, something very different to what we're accustomed to. Uh, that is a very intriguing aspect of the matter. Road in the outbacks of Australia, the Great Down Under. 
was a scene of a unique mass abduction. In the early hours of Sunday morning, August 8, 1993, three independent groups of people traveling in separate cars were taken aboard an alien craft and only later remembered the event without knowing each other. Kelly Cahill was one of them. My husband and I were driving home from a friend's house one night when we saw a 50-metre craft in, in a field, a paddock on the side of the road, and um, we stopped and got out um, and crossed the road, and so did a, a second party of individuals who pulled up about 100 metres behind us. All I could remember was seeing a craft hovering in the air, which we'd encountered a couple of kilometres beforehand, and then just seeing a blinding light and remembering nothing um, except knowing that something had happened because I, my heart was thumping and, and the adrenaline was pumping through my body, and all of a sudden... I'm, I'm totally disorientated and relaxed in the car. I didn't know what had gone on. Um, it was like I'd had a blackout. Driving back past the same area, I um, just got this horrifying feeling in my stomach and I just remembered everything that had happened when we'd stopped the car out on the field. But I um, had probably about six weeks where I couldn't remember anything, where I had this blank space. So and I've still got some missing time. It's not all there. It's only the first 10 minutes. Basically, after we got out of the car, we saw this uh, this craft, I suppose, uh, with some sort of configuration of round orange lights with a, a blue fluorescent haze underneath it um, that came down in a, uh, a conical shape and hit the ground in a semicircle. And, um, and as we stood there, uh, a tall black being seemed to just appear in front of it, followed by seven or eight others. Um, I felt this energy force through my body is the only way I can explain it, and I became hysterical, and um, they came rushing across the field. Uh, I was given a blow to the stomach and landed flat on my back in the grass, and uh, basically there was a, bits of a conversation going on that I could hear a male voice, but uh, I guess that I was uh, really struggling to stay conscious at that stage, and um, I remember, the last thing I remember was... Uh, Calling, calling for God's help, I suppose, and, and we were back in the car. About seven foot tall, they were black. Um, I, uh, their eyes lit up red. They weren't like that at first, only when I started screaming, um, and that's when they crossed the field as well. Um, basically, I couldn't see any other facial features except these big glowing red eyes and these tall, dark figures. Um, yeah, that, that was about what we saw. If Kelly had come in on her own, we wouldn't have found it uh, just a normal case, but um, what occurred was that we were able to get the other couple, uh, the other car that was involved in the encounter, and what, what made the encounter important to us was that there were two independent sources of this, uh, that viewed the same encounter, and uh, if you do research, you discover in these type of abduction cases, uh, uh, you tend to find that the groups are um, uh, come in, uh, you know, in some way related in some sense. In other words, the encounter occurs on the road, everybody hops out and has a look at it. Uh, in this case, the the two cars are separated by distance and uh, the, uh, the two groups uh, don't know each other and they, uh, in the end, disappear from the location and uh, consequently come back to, to have research done them on them in a separate, uh, at a different time uh, down the road. So, well, there was, uh, what we did, uh, we were first were looking for the location uh, to find, get the general location of the, uh, the encounter, which we discovered reasonably uh, easily, but the the main uh, data that we got was uh, from the field analysis was some ke chemical changes to the soil, uh, three markings on the ground. Uh, they were approximately um, 75 centimetres in, uh, in diameter. Uh, also, the, we used a special magnetometer to, um, to uh, go on the field itself, and we discovered a, 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 an unusual anomaly on the field that looked like a half moon or um, uh, facing towards the north. Uh, there was other things that came uh, from the encounter was that uh, each of the girls, especially, because the men seemed to be isolated from both of the cars, but the, the girls indicated to us that they'd been interfered in some way and that uh, one of the girls called Glenda, who's a, a trained nurse, a registered nurse, uh, she had markings on her, which uh, she went to a GP uh, and the GP photographed them and uh, constantly we had some very good evidence of a triangle under her navel and a mark on the left uh, inner thigh and uh, a mark on the base of her, down towards her ankle. Uh, so there was a lot of good evidence available. Um
There is no exemption for these extraordinary encounters, not even Israel, the Holy Land. Here, some extraordinary cases were reported since 1996. The first one from Nazareth, the little town in Galilee, where 2,000 years ago Jesus was raised, which is today one of the most important sanctuaries of Christianity. In the evening of September 15, I walked to the post office when some 400 meters from my home, I saw a huge round craft hovering only a few feet above me. It had five lights, each containing three smaller ones, red and brown and white. When I stood there and looked at the craft, I suddenly was lifted into it. I found myself surrounded by small creatures with stubby arms and tentacles coming out of them. One of them was a woman wearing a shiny green garment and a moon-shaped kind of helmet or hat. Then a larger creature appeared and the small ones gathered around it. It issued an order in a voice that sounded like a needle scratching across a record. And one of the smaller beings came closer to me and suddenly threw some kind of yellow powder at my upper body and face. That's all what I remember. I found myself on a spot ground of a school just a few hundred meters from where I was taken. I was totally confused, but I decided to go to the police station and report what happened to me. I arrived at the police station a few minutes later, but when I looked at the clock, it was almost 11 p.m. When I went to the post office, it was just before the closure, about 7.55 p.m. What made the incident especially interesting, he went to the police, the police removed the yellow powder from his arm, uh, from his elbow all the way to his wrist. It was analyzed at a Fula hospital. It was found to be, uh, be composed of a compound just unknown to the analysts there. It was 55% aluminum, and after that, was we never got the results after that. It was very strange. The papers reported that the soil itself could not have been from Israel. There is no soil like this in Israel. And they said the composition was extremely strange. And then, since then, nothing. But again, we have physical evidence. Uh, Yuri Isakov, a 63-year-old retired seaman, did not fly somewhere in his secret lab, uh, cook up this strange powder in order to go to the uh, full of police and fool everyone. The next day, I felt very bad. I had burn marks on my arm and face, which itched horribly and burned so much when water touched them, but I was not able to take any bath or shower anymore until this very day. In December, one gonad became badly inflamed. Most of the time, I'm in pain so badly that I cannot sleep anymore. But uh, the case of uh, Yuri Isakov from Natrat is very interesting because till today, from the day that he was uh, captured by aliens, as he, as he told us, uh, his wounds didn't heal till now, and he's bleeding, and nobody really takes care of him. And he told me last time when I was in his home, maybe the government just waits that I'll die so they can examine my body. And it was very sad to hear it. International experts agree that the abduction phenomenon is global by nature, not only in Europe, Australia and Israel, but also in Africa and South America. Only the reaction of different peoples is different, from panic and hysteria to curiosity and an inner transformation. The question remains, what does it all mean? Let's hear to which conclusions the researchers came. 
it's difficult to come to any personal conclusion about abduction, but one factor that does interest me is the inappropriate nature of the response to this phenomenon. Uh, I would suspect, and, and I would fully expect, abductees to react with fear and anger to what's happened, uh, particularly when painful and intrusive procedures are being reported. But a lot of them don't. They react in a much more positive way. Um, they go on to develop spontaneous interests in new age uh, issues. They develop skills as artists, uh, poets, painters, whatever. They become adept in uh, spiritual healing, for example. This strikes me as an artificial response, perhaps something that's been induced in them. And I can't help but wonder whether the transformative nature of this experience uh, shows that it's something been done to us by someone or some Something else, perhaps to try and lessen the threat we pose as we begin to go out in space. There could be any number of different reasons for them. Uh, for example, there's a tremendous amount of sexual content in abductions, and if it was, it, you know, if there were aliens here who were, who were. Uh, examining us and, 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 and uh, trying to understand us, one of the first things they would do would be to look to our sexual content, to our genetic. People were very much more primitive than we are. If we had any ethics at all, we would be extremely secretive so that we wouldn't shock them and destroy their growing culture and cause it to plunge into the same kind of non-meaning that happens in this world when, uh, when uh, native cultures are exposed to technology. Everything that they believed in is ruined and they usually, the culture itself just dies. Whoever's out there is making a great effort to bring us into contact without destroying our culture. The majority of abductees tell us that the ETs want to direct our attention on our ecology and its destruction, and that we cannot continue that way. Furthermore, they want to learn more about our anatomy. Third, they want to teach us something from what they have learned. And fourth, they want to heal us, which they did many times. It is for our own good, because we are destroying this planet. I mean, it's quite evident that if we don't change in our thinking, in our ways of handling with other people, we look down upon other people, we look down upon people who are different, or people who have another skin color, or people who have another religion. If we don't change and we don't realize that the planet Earth is alive, we are going to destroy this with pollution, with radioactivity, with atomic installations. So they are trying to take our sperm, our ovum, to have the seed of the human race, to, to have it somewhere if we blow up this planet. And they are also trying to make another race because uh, it seems that our race, which kills, which even today in Yugoslavia area, in Europe, is having a war, killing its own people is so primitive that it has to be changed. And this isn't the first time. We have been subject to genetic manipulation for thousands of years. Sometimes say it's, it's like a spiritual outreach program from the cosmos to the consciously impaired. In other words, I, I see it as a, as a uh, really a, an opportunity, an outreach uh, phenomenon that can enable through the hundreds of thousands, now millions of people that appear to be being reached by this to open consciousness, to uh, open us up once again to, the, to a universe that is filled with life, that is alive, that, that is intelligent, is not simply a, a lifeless uh, energy matter, uh, vast tremendum, but which is, is uh, divine and sacred and, and has um, uh, all kinds of possibilities, but it is, it, it does open us to the unknown, and I think uh, we've always been living in mystery and the unknown, but this confronts us so vividly that I think we have to face a lot of anxiety about what it will be.